another dull day outside, but I realised when I was doing the video, um, sorry, it's really echoing here, um, I realised when I was doing the video last week, although I spent a lot of time choosing potatoes, I never actually told you which ones I had chosen in the end, <laughs> which is not great. So that is the first thing I'm doing this week. I've still got them in their little bags, like this from Chapman's. So I said this before, that the reason that we like going to Chapman's is because you can buy them just by weight. So if you only want to grow two of one variety just because you don't have the space, but you want to try like more than one variety of potato, it's just so good to be able to pick them loose rather than having to buy like a whole kilo of potatoes. It's basically a whole bed. <laughs> so we like to do it that way. Um, and we've just picked up, how many did we get? Six of each of the varieties, which is going to be two bags. We're going to grow them in bags again this year. But the exception to that is the Red Duke of York. I don't know if you remember last year, I was given two kilos of Red Duke of York by Sutton's Seas. It was Sutton's. It was for um, being on their blog, on their website. That's what it was. I <laughs> knew for some reason they gave them to me. Yeah, so they gave me a whole two kilo bag of Red Dukes. And Red Duke is one that I grow every year anyway. It is a beautiful potato, but it's a first early. So what we're actually planning to do with these little chaps is put a whole bed over to them, which is going to be the bed that's closest to the shed. Not that that's relevant, but that's the bed they're going in. Uh, and we're gonna do whole bed and half of them we're gonna treat as first earlies. And we're gonna leave the second half in as essentially a main crop. Although they are a first early potato, uh, ones that we have left in previous years have just made the most fantastic jacket potatoes, you know, like really big, sizable, yum. Uh, so we're gonna do that. So Red Duke of York, let me just open them up. Red Duke of York are, oh, <laughs> that doesn't look red at all, but they're basically like the same color as my jumper. They are a beautiful potato. They date from about 1942-ish, supposedly. Um, I wonder if I can just get a bit off there, can you kind of see? Anyway, they're a magnificent potato. And what I like most about them is, firstly, the flavor is absolutely top notch. It's just a great potato. But also, even though they're really, really fluffy, you can boil them and they don't tend to collapse. You know, sometimes when you're boiling a fluffy potato and you leave it just a couple of seconds too long and then you've just got like potato mash soup. They don't do that. It is good for the forgetful cook. But yeah, they are a wonderful potato. So that is one that we weren't negotiating on this year. Definitely Red Duke of York. And the other first early that we're doing is one I've never grown before, but funnily enough, it's also a 1942 potato. So <laughs> that's obviously a theme for this year, but we're doing Home Guard. It's not a new variety, like I say, but we just happen to have never grown it before. But the write-up just said, great potato, scab resistant, good for everything. So we're having a go with it. On to the second earlies. Again, we're going for one that we've grown before and one that we haven't grown before. The one we've grown before is British Queen. It is a stunner, quite a bit older than the other two. It's like 1890s was the first time it's sort of mentioned. Uh, it's a Scottish potato, but it's incredibly popular in Ireland. Although they drop the British bit in Ireland, they just call it a queen. <laughs> We've grown this, we grew this one last year actually, it was one of the few potatoes that was a real success for us last year and they were just a really nice flavour, which is really the only thing that matters. You know when you are looking for varieties, this is just a side point, I'm rambling, but uh, side point is when you look at varieties and their descriptions, just always check that it mentions something about the flavour, because often they're like a beautiful, um, clean flesh, oval, uh, lovely yellow skinned potato, la di da di da. Don't mention that it doesn't taste of anything. <laughs> and we've made that mistake a number of times, not just with potatoes. I don't know if you remember the Benchmaster fiasco of the runner beans. Um, yeah, chose Benchmaster because it described it as an absolutely stunning runner bean. Little did I know when they say stunning, it just looked great. It tasted of nothing. Yeah, so don't, just always look for flavour. <laughs> Unless you're putting them on a show bench, obviously. I'm not putting anything on a show bench. Anyway, Ramble, British Queen, fantastic potato, absolutely loved it, doing that one again. And we are doing a completely new variety this year, new to me and new in general. It's called Caledonian Pearl. And that's the thing I would say about the description of them. Uh, it just basically said it was a fantastic tasting potato, good consistent tubers with a creamy yellow flesh, uh, tastes great. 
for someone to love. Yeah, so that's our second earlies, our British Queen and Caledonian Pearl. And then lates, we have got Kerr's Pink again. I don't know if you remember my Kerr's Pink experience two years ago. Where are they? Here they are. I'm going to open them because they're a great shape. Um, but my Kerr's Pink experience two years ago, first time I'd ever grown them, what a harvest. They were so beautiful and they were really distinctive. They're like a shell pink colour. Really a very pretty potato. You sort of see that's like a delicate pink. Obviously they're dirty at the moment so you can't really see them. Shell pink and also they're flattened. So like quite round that way but flat that way. And they made jacket potatoes for the gods. What a beautiful potato. They were so lovely. You see again like the flat just... Mm. That was the first year we grew them, we had an amazing harvest. Second year, uh, they really, really didn't appreciate the 40 degree heat in a black bag. It didn't really love that. So I think we put like three potatoes, three curls pink in the bag last year and we got about three out. <laughs> so that wasn't so great. But yeah, that is the first of our late potatoes. And the other one we're doing is absolute classic pink fir apple. Last couple of years, I know everybody knows the pink fur apple, it's a really like novelly, elongated sausage potato, waxy, really great flavour. But the last couple of years, we've actually been growing rat instead, which is a similar late elongated potato, but it's much, much less knobbly and it's a much cleaner potato. But they didn't have any rat this year and we just decided, well, you know what, haven't grown pink fur apple for a while, so we're going to go back to a classic. So yeah, that is my six potato varieties for this year. I'm terribly sorry that I completely missed this vital bit of information. <laughs> so I wanna stick some of these out to chit. Now chitting is a uh, highly divisive uh, subject at the moment. <laughs> to chit or not to chit seems to be the question of 2023. And I love chitting potatoes, but I gotta say, it's not necessary. You know what it's like if you leave potatoes in the ground, if you haven't dug them up thoroughly enough, uh, you haven't chitted them, have you? And they grow perfectly well, <laughs> particularly out of the compost heap or wherever you've left that potato. Uh, so yeah, they don't need to be chitted. I like chitting. I remember chitting potatoes from my childhood, just like the window ledge with all the little egg boxes on, potatoes all chitting away, it's very exciting. And also at this time of year, there's not a great deal for us to be doing. So having the like potato potential on the window ledge, I just love it. However, it's not necessary. And if you don't have the space, you don't have the space. If you want a, an incredibly comprehensive look at to chit or not to chit subject matter, <laughs> I will stick underneath a link to Steve Greenside Up's uh, really good video on why he doesn't chit, but I chit. <laughs> so there we go. Uh, and chitting is, very, very simple. It just means you're leaving your potato in a warm, light spot to start sprouting from the eyes. Let me get a potato out to demonstrate. Okay, potato. These little holes here, you know if you leave your potato in a dark pantry or whatever in the warm, you get these sort of these alien growths out the top of it. You're not aiming for that when you're chitting. That's when they've been in the dark. They start growing because it's warm and they're just like searching for the light. You don't want that. What you want is really neat, tight chits where they begin to grow and you get a good, like a dark color on them, leaf-wise, not black, but like, because <laughs> that's rotten. But just a good color, not kind of anemic, long tendrils. Firstly, they break off when you try and plant them and also it's just not great. You just want a really good, so you need them in the light and you need them in the warmth, but not too warm. I'm gonna be chitting mine out here. I don't want to start them off too quick, you see, because if I take them and put them in the sitting room where it's super warm and under the light, like these will be ready in no time and I'm not ready to plant them yet. So I'm taking them out of their plastic bag so that they don't rot and get sweaty. I'm just putting them in a nice cardboard egg box, bum down. You may not have known that a potato has a bum, but it does. Normally it's the pointy end of the potato, although, in the case of Kerr's Pink, they don't seem to have pointy end, but you will notice when you're looking at them, you get a roundy bit on the top, which is like the nose of the potato, where the majority of the eyes are, the little bits where they're gonna grow from, and then you've got a, a, like a often pointier bottom. So you wanna be pointy end down, eyes to the ceiling, and just leave them to go. And I'll be planting these out early March, 
The main point of chitting is just to give them an early start and like Steve says it excellently in his video, that can actually cause problems if you get your potatoes ready too soon, you put them out, they start growing, they can get checked by frost and then you've not, then you've started yourself ahead so you're ahead of the game and then you get checked by the frost, you actually end up behind the game. So it's not always ideal but that's what I'm doing. Um, out here in this cold, unheated bit of the house. Uh, it's not gonna get freezing, so don't put them somewhere they can freeze because obviously a frozen potato, not a great potato. Soft, nasty, squidge, don't want that. You just want somewhere cool and light. And it's good for potatoes. I'm well excited about potatoes this year. Last year, they really weren't that successful. This year, I've got a good feeling. Talking about things that really weren't successful last year, but that I have a good feeling about, blind optimism. <laughs> is the chilies. So, you know, I started the chilies off. Let's go and have a look because they need potting up. I'm gonna pot the little chaps up into this mixture, which is just uh, peat-free potting compost and vermiculite. Unfortunately, my compost is really soggy because I left it outside. So it was a bit cloggy, but never mind. <laughs> we work with what we've got. So these were my chilies, peppers and aubergines that were sown on the 4th of January. And you can see Loads of them have come up. So the ones that are up are quite leggy, obviously, because they've been, um, they have been under light, but they've been covered as well. But I'm going to pop them up now. So that is going to completely solve that issue. However, we've had pretty sporadic germination and some of them are rocketed away and some of them are only just coming up now. So what I'm going to do is take the ones that are ready to be potted up out of here and then infill the gaps and put these trays back into the propagator and see what else we can get to germinate goes without saying that you've got to be really careful at this stage and although I find these trays really fantastic on a space saving front it does mean you have to be extra careful at this stage because if you're using individual seed cells and you're sowing a single seed in each when you push them out you're much less disruptive of the roots with this they're all kind of intermingled together so just got to be really really careful with them but on space saving terms I've just don't think it's comparable. I'm quite happy doing this way. As long as you get them out in good time and you don't leave them in there too long so that their roots really, really mesh together and then you've got to rip them apart when you're going to pot them up, it's perfect. Potting up something that's quite leggy like this. So I'm using these quite deep square pots as their next stage pot, their individual pots. Just putting a little tiny bit of compost in the bottom, scooping the chili seed out with a teaspoon so that I get as much soil underneath as possible and dropping the chili right down inside the pot and then holding it straight and infilling around the edge. Then pushing the soil down, but being really, really careful not to push inwards against the stem. So you're just pushing down around the edge of the pot to compress the soil, not against the seedling itself because they're so delicate at this stage. And as you can see, these chaps, a lot of them are really quite leggy, particularly the aubergines. I had such quick germination on the aubergines this time. They were up within like two days of me sowing them, which is unheard of. <laughs> so yeah, they have got quite leggy, but they're onto two true leaves of their own now. So it's definitely time to get them out. As I was saying, we have had quite sporadic germination here and there's some that I've got nothing of. So I've sown two of each variety and really all I want to come away with at the end is one of each of these. The ones that I haven't got any for are the pineapple ahi, which I'm very upset about because that's one that I'm really intrigued to grow. There's no black Zulu up yet. The frigatellos, nothing on that horizon yet, which is a shame because mum absolutely loves them and so do I. They're a really good pepper. I didn't think I had any long purple, which is this chap here, uh, but one of them's popped up in the last like two days, so that's good. And there's one, the Bianca, the white aubergine, nothing up yet. But as I'm pulling out the ones which are ready to pot up, I'm just going to infill, trying not to disturb the areas where I've got ones that haven't germinated, infill, give them another water, stick them back in the heated propagator and see what else comes up. Hopefully we'll get another wave of germination.
gorgeous little chilies, aubergines, peppers. Pretty happy about that. Cucumbers coming on a gem. <laughs> yeah, not a bad morning's work. And these are the ones that I'm hoping for a bit more germination. I've left a couple in there that were a bit too small to transplant as well. So I'll let them get a bit bigger before I put them in their own pots. But I am using uh, only rainwater on all of these to avoid the disasters of last year. And I've also been leaving it indoors for a couple of hours first so that it's room temperature. Not to shock them. <laughs> Talking of unnecessary shocks, I'm heading up to the allotment. Crappy weather, isn't it girls? Bring back the ice and sunshine, huh? Yeah, I didn't stick it out there too long. <laughs> but look at this disaster. So the chilies down the center of this strip. So the ones on that end are fine. The ones on this end, they've really keeled over. And look, I had the curtain open and we got a really drafty window. And I think the draft has just come straight through here. And uh, yeah, they are not happy. <sighs> Fingers crossed for the little chaps. Well, we've had a bit of a change in the weather. This is the first day that it hasn't been in the minuses overnight. Ooh. Which means that the ground is finally not frozen. which means we can get some clearing done today finally which is exciting that's things like the very sad rhubarb chard <laughs> that's making me depressed every time i walk past it so i'll be able to get that cleared we've got the compost from last week that i picked up to do some mulching on some beds i also whizzed back round to the shop today to get some normal compost oh well, here we are chaps in the bomb shelter at the other allotment site look at this oh a bomb shelter full of compost what more could one want <laughs> And that lovely stuff I'm going to use to pot up the garlic.
is the first dot in. I realise in that video you might not have been able to see any drainage holes. Actually, these are all looking really strong apart from that one. But there are four moulded holes in the corner of this trough and I've also stabbed the bottom so they're not going to drown. <laughs> In the opposite vein of that, the other two troughs that I'm using are really super holy, so I'm going to have to line them. And I'm going to use weed proof matting, weed proof membrane, but there are two different types of weed proof membrane. One of them is particularly awful and one of them's much better. <laughs> so the two types, one of them is a very obviously woven plastic. Uh, it's sold as being really tough, but I just don't find it is. Whereas these two sheets of weed check I'm using, I've reused and reused and reused. You can see the state of them. Um, the plastic woven stuff decays and frays really, really quickly and you end up with loads of frayed plastic in the soil. It's like, um, you know, when a tape cassette used to go wrong and there's just the reams of ribbon coming out of it. That's what it looks like in your soil and nobody wants that. It's awful. This weed check is a very, very soft, almost felty like fabric. So it lets the water through and the nutrients through but it just uh, completely stops things coming up from underneath. So if you do want to weed proof mat under say gravel paths, or I've got this stuff in the poly tunnel on the path area where I had intended to put gravel, but I haven't got around to it yet. Uh, it's just a better option if you're gonna use weed proof matting than the ribbony plastic nastiness. Anyway, I will put a link underneath because I get asked all the time, every time I use it, where I got it from. Um, and it's just called weed check, but it's under there. So I'm planting this garlic really quite close together. Some things you'll read tell you to plant them 15, 20 centimetres apart sometimes, but I'm not growing show garlic. I'm not growing it for a bench. I will be chuffed as anything if I get more cloves out of these boxes than I put in with my track record of garlic. <laughs> but also because they're in boxes, they're going to be fed and watered a lot. So I just don't think I need to put them that far apart. I'm at peace with this spacing before somebody calls me up on it. Okay, that is the two larger troughs done and I've got some left over of the other variety, which I do believe is, it will be on the screen when I've looked it up. <laughs> uh, so I know I've got Carcassonne and something white. Uh, anyway, I've got some left over of both. And my two choices are either just jam them into the smaller one I've got so they'll be closer together, but in good compost or try and get them in a bed and just see what happens. I know what happens when they go in a bed. I'm kidding myself. I'm gonna put them in the box.
final I got final I got sorry about that <laughs> pleased I finally got them into a bit more compost which is really good and they uh, don't really need to be in the greenhouse I could have them outside but they've had a bit of a surprise um being transplanted particularly it seems the soil fell off them and it wasn't because they were over dry normally that happens if the soil is really really dry but I gave them a water beforehand I think they just I think I just didn't compact the soil down very well when I first planted them in so they're just <laughs> It's just like crumble um but anyway so they are in here temporarily just going to get used to it because we do have although it's not going to be freezing supposedly we do have a couple more nights where it's going to be like one two three and then looking at the forecast it starts rising again so when it starts doing that we will kick them out of the greenhouse but they're all right in here and this greenhouse is not a warm greenhouse it's not heated uh and what's it been recently oh mum's just reset it <laughs> Uh, it's eight at the moment it has been 12 uh, but I think when she looked at it earlier it'd gone down to two so yeah it, this is not a this isn't a hot greenhouse but anyway look sweet peas looking gorge by contrast what's not looking gorge <laughs> it's the poor old rhubarb chard look at it sad times over here I was really hoping this was going to just sit out the winter and come back good for an early crop in the spring, but that real cold weather is just done for it. So I am going to take them out. Normally with roots and things, I do tend to just leave them in the bed and let them rot down. They just become part of the soil structure, you know. But charred roots, it's happened to me before that I've just left them in there and they're so huge that by the time you come to replant in the spring, you go to dig down in there and they're still there. It's a bit like, you know, if you're replacing a fence and you don't dig out a fence post, inevitably when you're putting the new fence in, you want to go exactly where there's an old post but yeah these chaps look there's not much hope for them in there <laughs> the one bit of red that's visible isn't even attached which is excellent so yeah they're just soft and squishy and i don't think there's any hope for them which is a real shame so these guys are coming out other end of this bed we do have some field beans and i'm going to mulch just directly over the top of them they'll survive that they are tough as old boots I'm going to mulch this bed and the bed behind it, which is the newer asparagus bed, and they are either side of the same arch. And I'm going to heavily mulch around the base of the arch where I'm going to be planting the beans because they will really, really appreciate it. Not the field beans, but like summer beans. So there's going to be either balotti or French beans on this arch. Although I said I was going to dig these out, I don't really want to turn the soil particularly because we tend to try and keep the soil as intact as possible. So I'm just loosening the soil around them and I hope I'm going to be able to pull the whole lot out. If they're still solid enough for me to pull out, that's cool. If they're just mush, well, <laughs> that's how it goes. But yeah, look, I mean, this is this is the size of the root. These weren't even big plants. They never got huge. And uh, look at the size of the root ball. So yeah, I do think they needed to come out.
Lily Malu, Lily Malu, Lily Malu. We doing fluff bucket. Oh, is there anything quite as satisfying as freshly mulched beds? I don't think there is. I don't think there is. But actually, so this is the first two we've done this year. And the next one's in line has actually still got a parsnip in it. Just the one. <laughs> I don't know if you remember the uh, mono success, but it was a good success of a uh, parsnip we had just before Christmas. Um, we only had three parsnips left in that bed after they all got eaten off. <laughs> uh, but the, the two, out of the two that we've already dug up, one was Magnifico and the other one was just basically a round ball of gnarl. So we have got parsnip number three we're going to dig up now. But, but this is the next bed that's going to get mulched along with its partner on this side. Uh, so I do have to clear it, um, but it needs a bit of repair before we do it. Can you see that gap up there? I'm not very good at doing the reverse camera thing. Let me just turn you around <laughs> this bit up here see it's falling apart on the corner so i'm going to oh, just excuse all the weeds but i'm going to dig um out a lot of the soil that's in there and then force this one back up and reattach it to that side and this is actually the last of the original size beds can you see that it's about a foot longer than the other ones we've got down there um, this is because the old scaffold boards used to come in 13 foot, but unfortunately uh, that kind of wood was just too expensive when we went to replace it. So I went with the decking because it was the cheapest we could get and that came in uh, 2.4 metres. Uh, so the beds are just slightly smaller. So we kind of, but this is the last of them and the wood is still really good. So I feel a bit reluctant to take it out. I'm just going to repair it and I'm sure we'll get another couple of years out of it. So anyway. Let's have a go at that parsnip. Okay, do you want me to do it or do you want to do it? Just the one lid on that one. Oh, there's a tight, there's a little tiny one next to it, but that's the main. It's one that's starting to regrow over there. Hang on, let me go to this side. That's a good one. Well, I got that wrong, didn't I? It appears that there was one parsnip masking a whole collection of them. So uh, now we found ourselves a little bit parsnip rich, but never mind. There's two more in there to get out. Another beauty. Very nice one. unexpected we got <laughs> unfortunately I got that one with the can you see I got it with the blooming fork didn't I didn't know it was there here's some others there's some nice, nice ones size ones 
go get that tree. <laughs> yeah, we've only got one parsnip under there, Jesse. That's right. Blooming fool. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Right, well, we've got to eat some parsnips. Parsnips, yes. All right, okay. Parsnips tomorrow. Down now. Yeah, do you want to get the fork? <laughs> Sorry about the aeroplane noise, chaps. Uh, <laughs> it's the problem with being under the Heathrow flight path. Um, yeah, so it, under this bit of EnviroMesh box that we've got, which was the original carrot box, we've had uh, some red choy and some green pak choy growing away quite happily, survived the cold, which is nice, but the red one is just starting to bolt. So we're just taking the flower stems off for dinner. And this is green wave mustard at this end, which is a real favorite of mine, I love it. Normally it grows away really happily all winter, but obviously it's not been a normal winter so far. And I'm gonna just nip out the tops and a bit like what I was hoping was gonna happen with the rhubarb chard. I'm gonna take some of the growth off the top and leave everything in here and hope that it has a resurgence in the spring, which is what it should do. So we have early spring greens. But now we've got a bit of a harvest, parsnips, greens. I think it's time to head home. Let's go and see if those chilies have picked up actually. Ooh. Oh, it's that time again, chaps. It is the end of the week. But what I wanted to show you before I disappeared was, firstly, the chilies have recovered beautifully, but also, you know, the ones that I put in the bottom trays that hadn't come up? Well, we've had some progress. Have a look. Chilies all recovered. This one, I appear to have got a little stowaway in there which is excellent cucumbers are looking fab very pleased with them but in here can you see we've had a lot more germination so that is oh, hold on let me take the lid off rather than make it try to clear through what have we got okay so we've got two frigatello have come up Fantastically, I've managed to remove the label of this one at the front here. So we've got a mystery pepper. Is it ever a year without mystery peppers? One of the long purple aubergines has come up. A Manzano's come up and also an Anaheim. So we are just waiting really for KN. Oh, I've got lemons. I don't know why I've got that label in there. Still no habaneros or the pineapple. Oh! No, I'm wrong. I'm wrong. Look, this is the one I was most upset about not germinating. That is the pineapple ahi, which I'm really desperate to see how oh, different. Sorry, I'm, I'm all like shaking. <laughs> um, so that little chap there is the pineapple ahi, which is uh, the one that I really want to compare and contrast with the lemon drop chili, because apparently they look very, very similar. Uh, but it has a different flavour. So, um, so I'm very, very happy about that. That's really exciting. Um, well, I'm just going to go and pour myself a glass of wine to do you a cheers. But otherwise, I think we're about done, chaps. <sighs> cheers. So incredibly exciting that we have got defrosted soil really feels like something's starting to move ahead now <laughs> it's really oh it's just such a good feeling to start like getting all the mulch on the beds and i've got to do a bit of strimming because the grass just seems to have carried on growing all through that cold weather so it's big tidy now uh yeah loads and loads of uh, list making to be done that's something that i started last week and then got a bit overwhelmed by it <laughs> Oh, the list was long. Uh, so I'm going to do a bit of that. I've got quite a lot of chopping back to do on the allotment. The gooseberries, I think, is going to be a thing for next week. 
they desperately need a bit of help. And also mum's starting to get fed up with them because every time she walks past that side of the uh, fruit cage, she gets grabbed because you know what the, um, I was gonna say claws, they're like claws, <laughs> the ones on the gooseberries are just like, <sighs> every time she walks past. So yeah, I've got to sort them out, even if I'm just taking what's hanging out of the fruit cage off. So that's on the list. What else did we do this week? Parsnips, ooh ooh. <laughs> Having them for dinner tonight, I'm really looking forward to it. I'm not doing anything fancy with them, they're just gonna be roasted. I just don't think you can improve. It's a bit like the um, Jerusalem artichokes. I get asked a lot from people like, oh, do you have any other recipes? And I've said to you before, like, I just think you can't get better than them just roasted with just like, salt and pepper, a bit of olive oil. Mm. So good, but yeah, so that's what we're having tonight. But I'm sat here, you might notice that it's quite bright in my face. Well, it's because I'm sat here, like, looking at all of my little chilli seedlings and my cucumbers, and then the new ones that are coming up down there. It's just like my favourite place to sit. I come down in the morning with my cup of tea. Looks, must look really weird, because like the main windows are that way. If anybody walks past the house and looks in, there's just this girl like sat in the corner, like staring at this light box. <laughs> But it's exciting. It's really, really exciting. I'm excited about potatoes. I'm excited. It's now, what day is it? It's right at the beginning. It's not the beginning. It's right at the end of January. And I told myself that I wasn't going to go anywhere near my tomatoes until February. Well, I've only got, what, two, three days until it's officially February. So the tomato excitement is coming to the fore. It's all good. It's all good. I am going to say uh, goodbye though because this is probably getting very long and I've done a lot of ramble this week, haven't I? Yes, I have. Okay, okay, cheers chaps. Cheers to everybody in the Monday Club. Happy Monday. And cheers to everybody else for the rest of the week. I hope you have also thawed out and things are starting to move forward because uh, it's such a good time of year. Such a good time of year. The anticipation is just... Oh, I whistled. <laughs> I normally whistle. It's good. <laughs> Cheers, Jess. Cheers. Cheers.